Hello and welcome to Safe Investing as we continue our journey trying to understand different philosophies and approach to investing. Now investing is something that you do ideally over the long term and not necessarily between morning and afternoon of the same day and try to un and our objective is to try and understand and explain how investing can be different and the philosophies can be different particularly through the eyes and words of people who've been doing it for many years and many of them as we as as we have been uh, talking to and you are finding out have become legends of sorts in the world of investing in Indian markets. So I'm pleased to be joined today by Andrew Holland, the Managing Director of Avengers Advisors. Now, uh, Andrew has been investing actively in India through a fund for more than 15 years and uh, is uh, a long-term investor who also academically studies uh, what's been happening or how Indian markets have been behaving uh, over time. Andrew, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Right, so Andrew, first question. So. Uh, do you have a philosophy of investing? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look, um, well, when I first came to India, uh, I think that's the way I, I kind of think about it, is that you had two products. You had debt product or mutual funds and you had equity products. Um, you know, and both of them have their own risk. Debt, debt is obviously lower risk and equity is higher risk. Um, and there was nothing in between. Um, you know, so when uh, when we you know we started to, to look at how we could uh, approach that, then obviously a hedge fund, um, you know, is is one one approach which kind of helps you kind of get those risk adjusted returns on a consistent basis. So you're not facing as much volatility as maybe the markets uh, you know uh, you know can afford you at times. You know, we've we've seen more recently, uh, obviously, you know what happened in, in March. And whilst we recovered from that, um, you know, the swings in, in your portfolios uh, would have been at sometimes very worrying uh, to, be, to be more of, uh, you know, you, you're kind of a little bit more soothed by the fact that you're back to where you were. Um, but the volatility in between time has been, uh, has been very high right. uh, for investors and therefore, you know, causes you, causes you worry and, and, uh, and pain in terms of your, you know, your kind of net worth. Right. So when you look at companies specifically, as you've looked at companies uh, in the Indian markets or for that matter elsewhere, what, what are your defining principles? How do you choose a stock or a company to invest in? So we do it slightly differently than, than the, the typical long only. We look at the same parameters as any long only uh, fund manager in terms of uh, the growth prospects, uh, you know, the valuations, cash flows, balance sheets, P&Ls, all of those parameters you look at. Uh, but where we where we differ, I believe, is that you know we think about what's happening globally, what is happening globally to uh, the world growth, and how that impacts, in particular, um, interest rates globally, uh, currencies globally, and commodity prices globally. Because ultimately, that does have an impact in India. It could be from an economic viewpoint. It could be that you know the rupee uh, depreciates or appreciates. Um, it could be from funds flow uh, in terms of uh, funds, funds uh, buying Indian stocks, or it could be for certain sectors or companies, which will, you know, will either benefit from these tailwinds of, 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 of global growth, or, or will be, you know, kind of um, hit hard because of uh, some of right. those uh, factors as well. So, you know, by doing that overlay, um, you're looking at what globally can happen. So, for example, um, you know, if you like, say, an auto parts supplier, now, locally, you know, India might be doing fine, but globally, there could be some problems in the auto industry. And therefore, anyone exposed to exports or having, uh, you know, manufacturing facilities offshore would obviously be hurt by the, the global factors, not necessarily by the local factors. Right. And, and uh, so that's a good example. I mean, and uh, could you illustrate that a little more? And would there be cases where, let's say, the the fate and fortunes of a company or a stock that you're investing in India has not much to do with what's happening globally? Not, not very much globally. Well, well, obviously, those would be the more kind of mid and small caps, which are, you know, more domestic orientated in terms of, um, uh, you know, their, their prospects. So really, then you're, you're banking on a, uh, the, the growth of India rather than the, you know, the global growth or factors. But, you know, even there, um, let's just say, you know, pharmaceutical companies, you know, they've been hit, even though they might be only kind of more domestic driven in terms of their revenues, 
Uh, they've been hit by obviously the problems in China and APIs. So, you know, it could be a supply factor as well, uh, which, which hurts you from, a, from a, a global perspective, but even though you're only selling in India. So I think you have to look at all the, all the parts now, all the moving parts, not just, you know, are we selling only in India? Also, you know, are we manufacturing in India only? Are we, you know, reliant on any inputs? Um, into you know into uh, in, into our products. So, for example, FMCG oil prices would be uh, would, would would be right. uh, you know something to watch. So, all of these things you you can't not go think globally anymore in terms of risk. Right. So, the, so that is one way of saying that you know uh, okay, here's a company. Here is how it is affected or not affected by global behavior uh, or behavior of global markets, but. How do you arrive at something? Are you, do you say that, okay, all of this, here are the big mega trends that are happening globally in terms of demand, uh, supply, supply chains, uh, capital, and let me find companies that feed this, or is it the other way around? It could be a combination of the, of the two, actually. So let's just take, um, I, I know it's, it's more topical and, and we're getting through this, but, sure. you know, with, with the onset of, of COVID, I mean, obviously, you know, digitization is something that you know it's going to continue um, um, you know going forward is all working from home so therefore you know IT companies the, the likes of kind of reliance party you know have all kind of been beneficiaries of, of, of this uh, of this problem now if you look at say the themes going forward and we're all working from home um, you know would we need to live in cities anymore would we have to pay such a you know high prices, could we live outside of the city? So again, affordable housing could be the big theme. So these are kind of global factors which become local factors uh, over a period of time. Um, you know, the big debate at the moment is, um, you know, will the festival, you know, sales in terms of car sales, will it continue afterwards? Or is a trend now that we want to have our own and own our own car um, and transportation because we don't want to use public transportation over the next you know, few years or because we're not working from home, we don't really need to um, you know, use public transport, but we still want to get away and do things. So these are the, the trends which I think um, will emerge from all of this. So it can be global in nature, but obviously locally is, is how we're going to, you know, what, what we're going to drive. Um, and that's going to be the, um, you know, the interesting patterns and, and, uh, and right. disruptive right. patterns, I think, um, you know, which also become a risk. Right. And I'm going to come to the next layer of questions. You know, how do you, uh, when you uh, identify, after have, having identified a trend, how do you look at a company and then what you do after that? So b before that, uh, Andrew, is this the way you've always invested? Uh, you've always begun with uh, the macro view on uh, maybe the sector or industry at a global level and then gone down? Yeah. So you start off globally. What are the global factors, as I mentioned? And then we look at India's GDP growth, what's it going to be and, and, and why. And then identify those sectors, you know, which you want to buy, um, you know, which are going to be the drivers um, or the beneficiaries of our economic right. growth in India. And on the opposite side are the hedges, you know, the ones that you would want to kind of avoid um, if you're not hedging, uh, are those sectors which are going to underperform. Could be local factors, global factors, or a combination of the two. Those become the sectors you want to avoid and the companies you want to avoid. And then let's just say we like the auto sector for this example. Then it's, you know, what's driving the auto sector? Is it four wheelers, two wheelers, tractors, CVs? You know, what, what do we want to kind of uh, look at and where do we feel the value is uh, in, uh, in identifying, you know, the company or companies that we want to invest in? Right. And it's important, as you said, Andrew, to know what to avoid, uh, particularly if it doesn't, uh, you know, sync with some of those macro trends that you spoke of as much, even as you figure out what to invest in. So now, suppose uh, to pick uh, or go further with your example of an auto component company, what would be your next step? So then obviously, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, each of those companies individually and saying, you know, the prospects for each of those companies. And then, you know, trying to project uh, what you feel would be the profitability and the growth of that profitability. And then you start looking at the, 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 the actual uh, uh, valuations. Uh, how does A compare to B? Is B got more products coming through? Um, you know, market share increasing? Is there any margin pressure? 
what's the management, the governance? So all of these kind of questions get you know looked at um, in terms of you know getting your pecking order right. Uh, but of course, you know, in between time, you can have. Um, let me try and give an example: is that you can have company A who you feel is, <coughs> excuse me, has really you know got the valuation. Uh, it's very cheap, um, but you know there's there's no catalyst in the very short term to move that stock. Um, on the other side, you have a you know a, an auto parts company which is not doing as well. Uh, valuations a little higher. But there are catalysts. It could be a new product, uh, you know, having won a new account, um, you know, they could have done that, whatever it might be. Um, it could be that that short term um, kind of move, um, you know, is a lot quicker. So, what you have to think about is the opportunity cost between owning stock A and stock B. Um, and it's, you know, value might be in stock A, but you might have to wait one and a half years to get any, any returns, whereas stock B, has those catalysts in the short term where you'll get the the, the, the shorter term you know, returns that you're looking for. So I think you have to look at a lot of uh, factors, right. not just the fundamentals. Right. So now let, assuming both stock A and stock B are similar in nature in as much as they're similarly priced. So let's say that issue is, uh, is not the most important issue right now. What are the three most important things that you look at even as you delve into a company for the for with the objective of investing in it what, what are your benchmarks or what are your uh, trusted guides well, I think there's, there's three things that i mean as a you know if i don't understand the balance sheet and cash flows um very readily then it's a red flag for me because i should be able to understand it right i should be able to kind of look through um you know the, the kind of numbers and be able to kind of you know have a good idea so Things get hidden, right? Which you don't want to, um, you know, having to search for. So if I have to search for something, it means that someone's been trying to hide something. I understand that the balance sheet is one day, of a, one day in the life of a company, but you can do lots of things in that last day um, to to make your balance sheet uh, look a bit rosier. Um, I think that you know the second thing is is cash flow, and and cash flow to me is very very important because you know you for any company actually you don't you know, you, you don't go bankrupt because you have lots of debt. You go bankrupt because you can't service your debt. Um, so cash flow is very, very important to me. And I think the third and most important as well is obviously management and, and the governance. Um, because, you know, um, the first two factors um, could actually kind of be because of bad governance uh, in a company, um, you know, because they're hiding something in the balance sheet or the cash flow that they're generating is being put into assets which don't uh, really give me any economic return as a shareholder. Right. And, and let me come back to the first one. You mentioned the quality of balance sheets and maybe things being hidden. So what what has uh, caught your attention as and catch uh, or can help people maybe spot anomalies, if so, in balance sheets that they research or they look into? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, again, I'll keep on, on the kind of working capital Kind of cash flow it's obviously you go over the years and see how cash flow is moving and let's say for for one example you know your debt days go from 70 to 120 um and, and there's no no rhyme or reason that should have happened and there's no commentary uh behind that um in terms of the company then obviously this it's a red flag you know something's happened um you know for, for them to have the debt days go so high so you're looking at all the different elements of a balance sheet and, and cash flow uh, and, and uh, P&L to try and get that kind of picture of how either margins are moving, costs are moving, raw material prices are moving, to give you that idea of what might have changed over the years. And if you see one thing moving out of uh, relatively to your know, history, then it's something that you want to make a note of and say, you know, is this something I need to... Uh, to be wary of, or it's just a one-off event that could have happened, uh, and therefore, you know, it's okay that they'll, they'll go back to their normal uh, business, uh, you know, in the next year. So, would you say that uh, debt, debtor positions or cash flows are the reasons you have not invested in companies in the past, assuming all other factors have been constant? Yeah, it, it can it can be that. I mean, you've had that, uh, you know, across many many companies. Um, so, you know, 
one, let's say they pass that test and there's no problem in the balance sheet and the cash flows. Um, but obviously then, you know, what have they done with that cash flows? Um, have they invested wisely to get a better return or could they have just put the money on deposit and got a better return? Or could they give it back to shareholders through dividends or buybacks or whatever it might be? So all of those things you start to look at of what the company can do. But if you've got a, a good company growing very quickly, um, you would want to see it investing in its own business, right? Um, not generating so much cash, particularly in a low interest rate environment that we have. Now, if they can't invest it or they see no opportunities, that tells you one thing about the business that they're in. Um, and two, is a shareholder, you know, what are you doing for me? What are you giving back to me? Um, you know, for, for all this cash flow that you've um, uh, you generated. And there again, for those companies which, you know, seeing negative cash flow, what's the, going to be the impact on that in terms of the increase in debt? Can they service the interest? What's the cover of interest in terms of the profitability and so forth and so on? So, you know, all of these questions, all the questions that you have, uh, you know, initially can be looked at just by analyzing the, the P&L and profit and loss, balance sheet and cash flow. Right. And, and you talked about management quality. Now, uh, there are two kinds of maybe uh, it could be maybe divided into two issues. So one is, let's say, when managements are proactively transparent and they set higher and higher standards of disclosures and even in areas maybe you, you never expected. The other is where people maybe just, uh, you know, uh, just do what has to be done. So how do you review these two situations, assuming both are, let's say, exciting growth opportunities? You know, what's quite fortunate for us is that the market does it for us, <laughs> right? Um, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, if, if I go back, um, uh, you know, to, to when I first came to India, uh, and a few years on, uh, and we looked at the IT sector at that time, then it was, um, if I remember, it was Infosys, TCS, HCL Tech, or Bipro actually, rather than HCL Tech, and Satyam. Satyam was always at the bottom. It was always at a discount. Um, you know, to, to the others PE, and it never ever bridged that gap. Um, so the market has its own way of telling you um, that there's something, you know, that you're missing because, you know, the valuations, it's, it could be management, it could be something that you're not seeing, but someone knows something, uh, that's for sure. Uh, and, and it's not just in India, it's been, you know, in other markets that I've, I've worked in, in the UK and South Korea and Thailand, you know, markets will uh, will discriminate very quickly on corporate governance. Right. So when you, uh, uh, I mean, this is, you're really talking to people who are perhaps uh, taking their first steps or early steps. What are the other things you feel people should look at? You know, the temptation is that uh, the markets are strong. There are a lot of stocks which are run up. So there is no doubt that there are some companies uh, in, uh, let's say, in the BSC 30, uh, for instance, uh, or the Nifty 50, which meet most of these uh, early, uh, let's say, uh, filters of uh, qual management quality, balance sheet quality, and so on. So what, uh, but, but the temptation uh, uh, can also give uh, lead to maybe investing at very high prices and maybe never seeing them again, because maybe the, uh, the stocks lost its fancy, or maybe the markets lost its fancy, and we're seeing some good examples there too. So how do you then build uh, your approach? So it's all depending on the cycle that you, you're in. So, um, you know, if we take the more recent, uh, you know, last six months, um, you know, you would say that, you know, being in those defensive sectors like, uh, you know, uh, consumer goods, because we're all going to eat, uh, we all need to eat and drink and so forth. Um, pharmaceutical, because, we, you know, we're still going to you know, take pills and, and so forth. And, and IT, because of you know, you're still, we're all working from home, so we need some kind of technology. So um, technology stocks as well. So, you know, those are your safety sectors. Now, you know, coming out of that and you think that, you know, the economy is going to, you know, rebound in 2021, then, you know, where, where are you going to see the growth? It's probably going to be in sectors which are going to be from the economic recovery. So your banking sector, capital goods, um, metals, you know, which are probably a lot cheaper valuations than you're paying 60, 70 times for safety. And it's safety for the right reason. It's safety in terms of your know, revenue growth, profitability, 
cash flows, everything else, but they might not be the market performers of 2021. That might now fall to the next set of uh, sectors, which are there for the economic recovery. Um, and those would be the beneficiaries of that. And obviously valuations would be, would be more appealing because everyone's going to you know, shunned away from them in the short term to all find safety in, 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 in you know, going through the, what we've been going through in the last six months. Right. So, uh, Andrew, how long is the game? You know, so uh, the stocks are good, the prices are all right, uh, the management is of good quality, the global uh, trends are more or less in sync. Now, all of this is good. So, but if I invest today, when should I start expecting a return? What should my horizon be? I think for equity investments, I mean, my time horizon is, is uh, on, on, the, on the long side is, is more, you know, three to five years. Now, it depends on what I'm thinking, right? Uh, I would have a, a, a price target for at least the immediate term, which is one year. Because, you know, one year you can have a good guess of what you think will happen. Five years out, you know, a lot of things can change, right? But at least I'll know what my price target is in the first, you know, over the first year. Now, it depends if you meet that price target. If you meet it towards the end of the year, then you ask yourself, you know, do I need to kind of revise that price target? Is there anything else um, that I need to kind of think about which would keep me wanting to hold that stock compared to another stock? And again, it all goes back to asking that same question. What's the opportunity cost of me holding A versus B in the same sector or this one sector versus the other sector. So you've got to be looking at your portfolio on a consistent basis, not necessarily churning it, I'm not, not meaning that, but or saying, where's the opportunity? Do I need to kind of uh, diversify from where I am today um, you know, to, to the trends which I see in the future? So whilst it's always good to hold stocks you know, over a three to five year period, you might find that you know, this, for example, it could be just you know, disruption in the auto sector because of electrical vehicles, then what do you do? Do you, do you stick with the old uh, regime of, of companies or do you look towards the new ones? And, and, you know, and you've seen that very well um, in the auto industry in, uh, in the US, right? Where Tesla is now the leading company globally. Um, whereas, you know, who would have thought that five years ago? So what I'm saying is that the trends for auto ownership might still, you know, still, still bode well for a, a Ford or a GM. But, you know, obviously there's, there's been disruption and something's changed it where you need to think, change your thinking as well. So, yes, on a three to five year time horizon, but continue to look on a regular basis of what the trends and what you're seeing going forward. Right. And uh, my penultimate question. So, and equities is something that, uh, Andrew, you would always recommend to others over time? Yeah, I mean, I was brought up with the kind of, uh, you know, the debt to equity, you know, minus your age type of thing. So um, obviously for younger people, you would want to have equity. Unfortunately now for many years, we've had the SIPs, which is a great way of investing. Because you buy at the bottom, buy at the middle and buy at the top. Um, but over, over the years, you'll, 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 you know, your kind of uh, money will grow. I think the, the thing I would say in terms of equity investing is that there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, at the moment. And I think one of the things that I would suggest that people look at more and more um, is, uh, is ESG. Uh, it might not be a big thing in India at the moment, but it's a very big thing globally. Uh, and this will, you know, the shape out the way we're thinking about investing uh, for many different reasons. Um, so for example, can I even give you some examples okay. and give you some okay. global examples? So if you look at the uh, performance in the US, uh, of oil companies versus renewables. It's just a huge stark difference. Renewable share prices have gone like that. Oil companies' share prices have gone like that. If you did a very simple chart of Hindustan Unilever versus ITC, uh, you'll see Unilever going this way and ITC going that way. I'm not saying that's all to do with uh, you know ESG issues, but it's becoming more and more where you know foreign investors, um, and we're talking you know thirty trillion dollars of, of money now, will not invest in tobacco companies, um, and you know it, it obviously has an impact over time. When you say ESG, of, you mean environmentally sustainable goals, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. 
Yeah, so so those are the kind of new trends which you know are also going to play play through. So I'm just uh, you know asking about you know potential investors when looking at um, when looking at companies to add this new dimension um, because companies um, you know will be forced to kind of change or or they'll just be abandoned. And I think what got me first interested in ESG many many years back uh, was a BBC documentary on a on a tea company. Uh, in India, uh, where you know it showed um, you know underage workers uh, working on the on the plantations. The next day, apart from the share price falling, uh, most of the companies who bought from you know globally who bought from this company took their orders away day one. That was it, finished. Um, and it's taken years for this company to get back to right. um, you know some some kind of um, credibility back with uh, with global buyers. Uh, last question, uh, Andrew. So, over over the years, tell us about the one rookie uh, mistake that you've made from which you've learned, and the one uh, uh, strategy that has really paid off for you. Um, well, I've made many mistakes. So, <laughs> yeah, so the one big one. Uh, you know, I not more recently, but um, it's a hopefully it's a it's a reasonably funny one. But uh, when is not listening to other people. Um, I was told many years ago, you must buy this stock. Um, and um, so I did blindly thinking it was, you know, it's fine. And, um, you know, I was watching the news that night and, and I saw it's an oil company. And uh, I saw that the, you know, the company's oil rig was on fire. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I bought a company where the oil rig's on fire. So the next day I phoned up the, the person who gave me this idea and said, you know, what are you doing? What is this oil rig on fire? He said, no, no, we, 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 we bought it because there's some guy called Boots Hansen who's going to come, come over and from America and put it out, uh, put out the fire. And that's the reason I bought it, apparently. Um, so don't listen, do your own homework. Um, is, is, uh, and, 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 you know, a lot of it's very simple, right? We all know the story of Apple, we all love the phone. You know, some of it's, it's easy. If you've got children, you love Walt Disney, they do, they love Mickey Mouse. So very simple kind of uh, stocks which you can look at. So that's one of the big mistakes that I, I've made. Um, and um, in terms of the successes, I, I think it's being aware of, of that, um, because we run a hedge fund, is thinking what are the risks to the downside. I'm always thinking what can make the share price fall. Um, and also that when you think a share price should be going higher, and for some reason it keeps going down, is that the market's trying to tell you that there's something wrong. You've got something wrong. So don't stick to your, oh, well, you know, my fundamentals are right. You're missing something. Go back and do your homework again. So those are the things which... Uh, have, uh, have helped me out uh, at a number of stocks, which you know I thought initially was great, uh, but then found out that there was something I'd missed. Andrew Holland, uh, thank you so much for speaking with us and sharing your insights as, uh, as we continue our journey in safe investing and the philosophy of investors like yourself. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.